The Verge, T-Mobile, and SpaceX partner to let customers in areas lacking T-Mobile service use Starlink for SMS, MMS, and quote unquote, select messaging apps in some markets in 2023. This is one of those things that Elon does. I think it's very difficult to It makes it hard for me to sort of tip the scales and say Elon is too much of a agent of chaos. It's not it's not worth giving him any attention. It's not worth taking him seriously. All those sorts of things. Because operating an extension of the internet from space and making it available in a very straightforward way, you buy one piece of hardware, you pay one service fee, and you go do what you want, is something the planet needs. I think we could all agree. In a past era, it was the Department of Defense who financed and brought to life a series of satellites that orbit the planet, which provided, at least initially, utility exclusively to the U.S. government, but eventually was opened and made available for the free market to take advantage of in whatever way it chose to. Let's see what I'm working with. Which is how you get Uber. Because you have GPS satellites. I'm certainly not trying to make some comparison and assert that Starlink will ultimately provide the same sort of egalitarian uh, benefits to the rest of the industry. Because this key phrase in quotes, select messaging apps. SMS and MMS are standards that every cellular network operator on the planet agreed on. Therefore, they are woefully outdated and lacking in all manner of ways in 2022 as compared to when they were brought into production. Uh, 1990s, probably. Somebody looked that up. Which apps are going to be allowed to take advantage of this benevolent aspect of Starlink service. It's not entirely clear um, how someone will take advantage of this issue, right? If you're a T-Mobile customer, is T-Mobile gonna subsidize the hardware, right? Are they gonna make it easy for you to get access to the Starlink network? Seems like a good guess, again, having only read the headline, uh, because that's what network operators have done for 20 years, is subsidize the hardware that allows you to access the network, because using the network is, is where they derive the bulk of their revenue. Side note, this is why it's especially frustrating that network operators, at least in America, refuse to just settle in to the fact that they're network operators and they're not content producers or providers. They shouldn't have an opinion. They should just provide you the dumb pipe. But that's beside the point. Is Telegram going to be something that you can use on Starlink's network? Is 
WhatsApp, is iMessage. Right? There's this big looming upgrade to SMS and RCS, excuse me, SMS and MMS, which is RCS. And Google is just in the last month uh, shipped probably the most aggressive bit of marketing, certainly in recent memory from the company, possibly ever. I don't know, remember the URL off the top of my head. You can find it. Um, but Google's marketing message is your texting experience all of the reasons that it sucks are Apple's fault. That's some serious shots fired. So these deals about which messaging app T-Mobile users are going to be able to utilize is where the rubber meets the road. Right? It would be shocking to me if... Starlink did not allow iMessage as a as a blessed uh, messaging app, as a blessed application that you can run on their network to use traditional parlance. But I don't know. Like maybe they will because Elon. And in a world where the messaging app that you use, that you prefer amongst your graph, isn't able to be operated on the network that you use to gain access to the internet, that's a world that I don't think many of us would choose to live in. Um, so, I don't know, It'll, this will certainly be interesting. Because I think on a long enough timeline, uh, Starlink becomes the network provider for a material percentage of, of people on the planet. Because by comparison, uh, deploying state-of-the-art traditional cellular networks is only getting more expensive. It's only getting harder to do. And I think that there's no clearer piece of evidence for that than the massive push to move customers onto 5G capable devices and in so doing lock them into payment contracts that's how the network operators make money they don't like nobody leaves their network operator because they aren't getting the speed they're advertised they might leave a network operator because the sort of floor of network experience is insufficient. But even in those scenarios, you've signed a multi-year agreement with a carrier. How many people break those agreements because the network experience is so poor? My suspicion is not many. Most people suffer and complain and wait out their contract. So if Starlink can provide a competitive experience for people, and yes, you're not going to use Starlink as a replacement for your cellular provider, but your home internet provider? Is anybody really having a great experience with their home internet provider? maybe in the United States, the rest of the developed world, but outside of those areas where all of the growth in computing and internet usage is, right, in the emerging world, 
I think that'd be the place where you see Starlink make big inroads, but we'll see. Lawrence Abrams, bleeping computer. LastPass says a hacker stole portions of its source code and quote unquote, proprietary LastPass technical information two weeks ago, but users' master passwords are safe. I mean, this is the worst possible scenario for a business that operates a password management service. Educating the average user to understand that while their data is housed on somebody else's physical hardware in the cloud, that the system is architected in such a way that the only key that can make that data accessible resides inside of their brain and maybe a laminated piece of paper in a safe deposit box and maybe the brain of their spouse. That's a really difficult thing to teach people. You don't want any compromising of your service because it's just enough of a wedge to get people who have not truly internalized that lesson, which is to say, they know why it's true that the key that they use to unlock all of the information that they store in their password manager could not have been compromised and not being a LastPass user. I'm assuming that LastPass is operating its business uh, in a sufficiently mature way and that that is their architecture and that there is no copy of a user's master key, master password that's stored anywhere and that's possible to be compromised or, or uh, uh, that it's vulnerable. So we're giving them the benefit of the doubt. But the problem here is it's all downside PR and the amount of effort you need to spend to double down on educating your user base to the fact that it's not possible for their information to have been, to be out in the wild. That's just a really difficult lift because unless you're a nerd, who wants to subject themselves to those lessons? Who wants to go learn that stuff? Wouldn't you much rather go learn how to make a kick-ass sandwich? So, Godspeed, last pass. Time to do a set. New York Times, a federal judge ruled Cleveland State University violated the Fourth Amendment when it used monitoring software to scan a student's bedroom before a remote test. It's 
it's nice to see the American judicial system doing Any time you see the American judicial system siding with the individual, preserving their individual rights, I think that's generally a good thing. In particular, when we're talking about protecting an individual's ability to do things that are demonstrably of no potential harm to others. It's my little Second Amendment caveat. This is good. I'm really spooked at the thought of what that scanning software is capable of. Because if you received that as a brief, build us a piece of software that throws out a net and looks for anything that we could potentially construe as uh, a mechanism for someone to cheat this intellectual aptitude test, this exam. Uh, you're going to cast a really wide net, aren't you? I think you're going to use the camera on the laptop and you're going to image everything the computer can see and then you're going to try and OCR right? and you're going to try and perceive readable text anywhere you can because if I'm sitting in front of a computer taking an exam in my room and I want to artificially, I want to cheat, I want to artificially inflate uh, the perceived degree to which I understand the material, I'm going to put the source material in front of me, right? I'm going to have the book open. We still live in a world where there are a number of exam situations, both in academics and in other areas, where it's not acceptable for you to just have the book in front of you. You actually have to have internalized the knowledge. So a piece of software that is just surveilling everything you're doing that your laptop camera can see, you can tell yourself that it's only used during the test. What's the big deal? The number of times that the Ring doorbell products have received negative press because they were submitting recorded, they were submitting data, they were submitting footage to police departments without requesting the permission of the individual citizen who bought that camera and hired it to do a particular job. It's more than one, keeps being an issue. And I am certain that there is language somewhere in the end user license agreement for a ring camera that says in certain circumstances you agree to allow us ring the business that operates the device on your behalf to take footage and do with it what we will insert your opinion about whether or not you think uh, the average law enforcement agency in America 
is only issuing warrants for the footage that ring doorbells produce in defensible scenarios, who knows? But the point is they built the software that, again, my assumption is just recording its field of view into dorm room, private space of a child, an adult in the eyes of the law in most cases, but I get the feeling that like one of the moons that orbits the inevitability of understanding that the climate of the planet is changing is the inevitability of understanding that 18, 19, 20, 21, these are not ages where the average human being is making the most judicious choices about what they do. And in a moment in time where what you do can be documented in high definition and stored indefinitely and taken out of context. That's a really big issue. <laughs> because I don't know about you, but if there were an unlimited archive of high definition footage of everything I did in my room, between the ages of 18 and 24, I would not feel good about that. Jonathan Vanian CNBC. Mark Zuckerberg says Meta will debut its next VR headset in October with better eye and facial tracking features to bolster users' feeling of quote-unquote social presence. The easy money here is to put the image of Zuckerberg's avatar right below me here. If you haven't seen that, you can go find it. Um, there's a pretty good one where they take the, the one cut in the third act of the social network where Andrew Garfield's character, whose name escapes me, is leaning over Mark and shouting at him about how he'd better lawyer up because he's not just coming back for his fair share of the business that he helped create, but he's coming back for as much as he can possibly take. And then they cut and Mark is sitting in his desk chair, sort of leaned back in order to maintain gaze and it's avatar Mark, it's very funny. But it's also illustrative of what I think is the more important thing here, which is they understand what is arguably the most important technical challenge to solve in order to facilitate people to maintain human relationships through software. In a, in a fully rendered environment, right? Because on a long enough time scale, the avatar thing stops being a problem, right? And there are, there are a handful of obvious paths that you could envision. We normalize a particularly goofy looking avatar. Apple started planting those seeds years ago. If you don't think that whenever they bring their VR product on stage, that their Memoji 
their version of the avatar that you create for yourself will play a strategic role in that product's rollout. I don't think you're paying attention. And so it's clear to me that they understand this problem because whether you wind up with a cartoon-like avatar or here's a lunatic scenario, Meta buys Unity and says, keep doing whatever you want to do in the gaming space. We'll take a little recurring revenue from that business because why not? We don't like, is gaming going to be of strategic importance uh, with a, with a VR slash AR device? Probably, but that's not even the point. We need unfettered access to your state of the art human modeling capabilities. So you can envision that version of the future where we wind up with not perfect, but as close to perfect as you can possibly get. And I've been watching all of the academic research over the last five years into just how lifelike a synthetic human being can be authored by software. Even if you solve that problem, if the eyes don't look you in the eye, your monkey mind is going to tell you one of, I don't know, at least two things. Either this person isn't genuinely invested in my interaction with them because they're staring off into space. Or this isn't real. It's fake. It's software. Talk to everybody who's been in visual effects. Talk to anyone who has ever worked at ILM. Uh, the gold standard is we used computer graphics to make a change in what you see on screen and you didn't know. That's it. That's the game. And so maybe it does make more sense as I'm saying it out loud for Meta to go scoop up Unity because the dark horse here that we haven't really talked about, but that people like Matthew Ball are certainly banging the drum on is Epic has been working and working and working and working and working on making Fortnite the sort of place where people choose to spend time in order to interact with one another. Does that mean that they're going to get into the business of encouraging you to put goggles on your head so that you can have as close to a real face-to-face -face interaction with another human being as possible? I think it would be foolish to ignore that possibility. Oh, related. Mark Zuckerberg talks with Joe Rogan about his life, content moderation decisions, the FBI and the Hunter Biden laptop story, the metaverse, and more. All that's really necessary to say about that is Mark, because again, nobody can tell Mark what to do. Mark agreed that there was more value in having an opportunity to share his message and where he wants to go with this technology, nay, culture at large, that it was worth going to Joe Rogan as a venue. And that whatever negativity may be associated with Joe Rogan, that that was worth it. That trade-off was worthwhile. If that doesn't tell you that he's serious about 
not giving up on shaping culture. I don't know what it is. Time to do a sound. Twitter. Twitter rolls out podcast integration into its redesigned spaces tab, starting with some English-speaking users globally on iOS and Android. Classic bit of misdirection, perhaps. I get it. It's entirely possible that this feature was going to ship this week, no matter what, and that the complaint that Mudge filed with the federal government in no way influenced rolling out this functionality. But, as continues to be a theme for me, if you don't believe it's even possible that the company had this functionality in as close of a ship-ready state and that somebody at a senior level made the judgment call that they needed a new narrative about the company right now. This is a perfect one. Podcasts are huge as a medium. I think most of us would agree with that. And so merging an experience that many of us are already familiar with You get your daily information diet by wearing a little thing in your ear or pressing a button as you drive your car. Weaving that together with the Spaces product, great idea, great strategic move. Because now you get to layer into the same interface where people go to control what they're going to listen to from the sources they know of with what they could listen to from sources that they hadn't considered, right? Because what spaces are presented to you is at least in part um, a function of who you follow on Twitter. Um, the, the, the sort of crossover benefit there, I think, is really high. The other thing that jumps out at me here, and I could be wrong on the technical capabilities, but at least on iOS, If you have background audio running, then my understanding is your app has slightly elevated permissions is the wrong word. It is is prioritized to stay in memory and to not be ejected by the operating system. And so I think it's possible again, I could be wrong, that to the extent that Twitter can encourage people to use Twitter to listen to things, then the rest of the Twitter app has just slightly more traction on your attention. And so its ability to land notifications that are going to uh, get your attention, get you to engage, could be greater, right? This is complete off the dome nonsense on my part, but is it not possible that a Twitter podcast feed could receive 
as dynamic add insertion, the tweets from global trending topics or personalized trending topics, I know that I would be far less likely to skip the podcast ads that come up in what I listen to if part of that ad break was, here's a thing that 70% of the users, the, the accounts you follow on Twitter are talking about right now. How am I not going to be drawn to that? So I think it's a smart move for them. It could work it could just as easily evaporate in a month's time. Who knows? Tom Hall's Reuters. A judge orders Twitter to give Elon Musk data from 9,000 accounts sampled in Q4 to estimate spam and bots, but rejects his other demands as, quote unquote, absurdly broad. Related, Sheila Dang, Reuters, in a series of tweets, Jack Dorsey expresses regret that Twitter became a company, saying the service should be a quote unquote protocol not owned by a state or company. The Elon thing, I'm going to continue to put on a shelf because there's a trial. It's right around the corner. And who's to say whether a sample of 9,000 accounts is likely to influence Elon's behavior? If I had to place a bet on red or black, I'd say, no, he's not going to receive this data and then say, oh yeah, turns out I was right. Or, oh yeah, turns out I was wrong. I don't think there's anything there. Instead, I'm gonna focus on my personal favorite topic, which is communication protocols as opposed to communication platforms. Uh, the seminal piece on this topic, Mike Masnick, Tech Dirt. Go find it. Mike Masnick. Protocols, platforms. I don't remember the exact wording of his headline. One of email's greatest strengths is it has a completely global address space. Yes, you can spoof uh, an email address, but by and large, if you know my email address, then you can direct communication at me. And you as the sender don't have to do anything else in fact, quite frankly, there's not much else you can do in order to ensure that I intake the communication that you send. Could that information get caught by spam filters? Yes. Could that information get filtered out because I have elected to construct rules that prioritize communication from some set of addresses versus others? Absolutely. Um, many people don't use email at work anymore, but you will notice more often in the last five years, if you send an email to someone at their corporate address and they reply, 
If you go down and you look at your original message, you'll notice when it's quoted by their mail client, you'll notice that it often labels the message as external. That's a, some piece of software running on Exchange or on Google or some other service that's delineating between this is a message that originated from a user that is inside of our walls and probably therefore more trusted as opposed to outside. It also conveys to the user, you ought to take more care in what information you share in response because you're talking to someone who isn't bound by the same employment agreement terms that you are. Trade secrets, yada yada. Twitter, in its purest form, is a way to send some piece of communication. All right, we go back to the very beginning. It was, you can send text. And the total number of characters is gated by what the SMS network protocol allows for, to go back to what we were talking about earlier. And you can direct that to the public, or you can direct that to an individual user in the form of a DM, or you can direct that to a particular set of users by mentioning them in the message. Although important to note, when you mention other accounts, other addresses, that's what they are, in a message on Twitter, that message can still be de facto public, right? Based on your user preferences. If your account is public, then anyone who follows your account will see that you, quote unquote, directed a message at these three other addresses in the system. This is good design because it enables users that you as the sender are not directly addressing to potentially gain value from the information that you're communicating. When I worked at Microsoft, one of the you know, sort of pet projects that used to get bounced around in the cafeteria was how much would the culture of the business change if when you sent a mail, you could address it to particular people, but it was de facto public within the organization, not globally public. And therefore, the content of what you're communicating to those three hypothetical recipients could be made available to anybody else in the organization. How much duplicative work would evaporate in that scenario? How much unintentional, serendipitous, self-organization of employees would be possible in that scenario. Fucking wild to play with as an idea. That's what Twitter does. That's why it's sticky. It's not sticky because there are professional loudmouths who say bombastic and preposterous things. That helps, but the way it got stuck into the bones of significant number of people is it's kind of the only tool of its kind in the sense that what you communicate is again, assuming you leave your account public, um, available to anybody. That's the power of it. 
And so to the extent that Jack regrets turning it into a business, yeah, it's kind of a bummer. Though there's a chicken and egg thing there, right? Like, could it have become such a sticky aspect of culture in 2022 were it not a for-profit business for many years before? Maybe, maybe not. We'll never know. But striving for a future where it becomes a protocol that anybody can use, that you can install the in-house Twitter client, you can install a third-party Twitter client, you can build your own Twitter client from scratch, and then you can interact with that network of information tremendously powerful. I don't think there's a more important piece of work being done today than the work that people like Jay Graber are doing, trying to create the underlying infrastructure and architecture necessary to create a protocol that is being created by an independent body. Yes, they were financed by Twitter. Yes, there's obviously a relationship between at least Dorsey and the Blue Sky uh, group. But legally speaking, whatever they create will not be the property of Twitter the business. And so you will have to get Twitter the business to ultimately want to adopt that protocol and thus allow every tweet that floats through the system to, to run on that protocol and therefore be made available to any and every other piece of software that's written to become sort of a client and a citizen of that protocol. But if you can get there, incredible incredible possibilities. You know, if you've been using Twitter for a while and you fell off, look into um, shared block lists. I don't remember the name of the, the particular product at the moment. And to be perfectly honest, I myself haven't employed it. So in a sense, I'm giving myself homework right now. Um, the ability to rely on a community to create what are essentially spam filters say you don't want to hear from these people and you don't want to hear from those people and you don't want to hear from those other people that can turn the dial away from noise and towards signal and when you have twitter with a high enough signal to noise ratio and this is the huge asterisk enough of the people that you want to communicate with using it, it's unparalleled. So I hope that we can pull off the protocol thing. <laughs> David Ingram, NBC News. California's attorney general says Sephora will pay $1.2 million after failing to tell customers that it was selling their data, marking the start of CCPA privacy law enforcement. Here we go. California leads the way whether many of you like it or not. Creating legislation that codifies the idea that taking user behavior in the form of explicitly communicated 
preferences or information, as well as implicit information in the form of how you use something, where you use it, with whom do you use it, when do you use it. Not disclosing that as a business, you're taking that information and using it for your own benefit. It's not okay. We all, to the extent that we operate in a internet enabled society, we're all creating information and it's sort of, we leave a trail and maybe it would be better in a world where uh, the ephemerality of that information was more actively enforced. I'm sure there's a more extreme version of the CCPA that died on the cutting room floor, which said, you're only allowed to retain information gathered about your users or your customers for X period of time after which it must be destroyed. That was never going to go anywhere. But revealing, being transparent about what you're doing with that information. And then, but in doing that, equipping the public to vocalize its acceptance or or denial of that behavior. That's a good thing. That's a world we should live in. I don't know if $1.2 million is material to Sephora. Something tells me it's not. But the precedent, the fact that this wasn't settled out of court. Well, was it? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Um, the precedent that if you do this as a business, you can be fined because you are in violation of this piece of legislation, in the state of California. Rad, keep it up. Last set. That's the first time I've had such a poor squat performance, and I'm not angry about it. I know why it's poor. I didn't sleep. I didn't eat. I can fix it. Carly Page, TechCrunch. DoorDash says hackers accessed some of its internal tools and customer information after compromising a third party vendor as part of the recent Twilio breach. Related, Carly Page, TechCrunch. Group IB details hacking group Octopus responsible for the recent breaches of Twilio and 130 plus organizations that netted close to 10,000 employees' credentials. Consequence of evolving toward more SaaS tools produced by a wider variety of groups being woven together to provide um, the infrastructure on which businesses can operate. That's what this is. In the alternate universe where uh, 
Microsoft and NBC News and Tom Malone at uh, Charter Communications, although it wasn't called Charter Communications then. The alternate version of the future where it was an information superhighway and all of the infrastructure was controlled by an extremely small number of players, you don't have things like this, right? Because if, if you're DoorDash and you have a single supplier for all of the backend infrastructure you need in order to operate your business, this isn't likely to happen. Or maybe it doesn't change the probability. I think it does. Um, but I think most of us would agree the benefits of an open market for software as a service outweigh the drawbacks. Because what's the drawback here? Uh, customer information may be out in the wild. But if you're a DoorDash customer, yeah, there's sensitive information. DoorDash knows where you fucking live. Take that seriously, right? Like Strava knows where you live. That information gets out in the wild. It can be significantly dangerous to all sorts of people. But frankly, the sole action that an individual user can take to maximize their security going forward and hopefully to minimize the impact of any given breach is reset your account credentials, reset your password, which is why this related story is what it is. The reason this hacking group is worthy of press at all is the total number of compromised employee credentials that they allegedly now hold. Let's go back to the XKCD, you know, Bible, stone tablet. Like, there are so many instances where XKCD provides the single most succinct, worthwhile illustration of why a particular element of living in an age of machines is frustrating, whatever. Two hackers sitting across from each other. Hacker number one says, well, actually, sorry, it's two paints. I don't know why I'm going to illustrate a comic for you, except that I really like it. In the first strip, it's titled, How the Average Person Thinks Hackers Work. And it's two hackers, they're wearing masks, they break into your house, they jump on your laptop, and they just start like harvesting any information they can about you. So they're gonna hack the Gibson. The second strip, How Hackers Actually Work, it's two people sitting across from each other in a cafe. And hacker number one says, hey, somebody uh, managed to breach the Smash Mouth fan forums and dumped all the usernames and passwords and email addresses for the people who use the Smash Mouth fan forum. And hacker number two says, let's run that entire data set against the top five banks in America. That's how it actually works. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if you experience, like if your bank account gets drained, so these are un unnecessary extremes. The point is the most common source of weakness is that convention we use, a string of characters bound to a publicly knowable string of characters, which is your address or your username, 
is an inherently vulnerable system. It's not mentioned here, but far and away, the most important advancement coming in the next version of iOS is pass keys. It's Apple's wrapper, Apple's implementation of public key exchange cryptography methods. I won't go into all of that right now, but suffice it to say the end user experience will be you go to create an account for a new app. You go to create an account for DoorDash because you've never used DoorDash before. In the not too distant future, your Apple device will say, okay, we're going to use your email address as your username. And your device is going to create a secure relationship to the DoorDash service. You don't know anything about what that secure relationship is bound by. All you know is when you go to sign in to DoorDash, rather than being asked for a string of characters that you either memorized and are reusing all over the place, or is stored in a password manager, instead of either of those things, all you're gonna get is use face ID or touch ID to authorize access to DoorDash. That's it. That's the whole ball game. That is such a fundamental improvement for the average human being. I don't think it can be understated. I'm super psyched for that. And uh, shared iCloud photo libraries. Manish Singh, TechCrunch. Sources, India's Enforcement Directorate conducted searches at CoinSwitch Kuber for allegedly acquiring shares worth $200 million in violation of Forex laws. Uh, I don't know anything about coin switch Cooper. I don't know anything about Forex laws. So the only thing that feels worth saying right here is we're going to continue to experience significant growing pains as the notion of money gets evolved to be compatible with our age of machines. See Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, all the rest of it. That's it. Hannah Miller, Bloomberg. Alameda Research CEO says FTX Ventures absorbed Alameda's VC operations. FTX's Amy Wu says the transition began in January of 2022 when FTX Ventures raised $2 billion. Related, Brandy Betts, Coindesk, FTX CEO Sam Bankman Fried denies that FTX Ventures is merging with Alameda Research's VC operations. Hannah Miller, Bloomberg, FTX's Alameda Research co-CEO, Sam Trabuco, steps down, saying he has chosen, quote unquote, to prioritize other things. Co-CEO Caroline Ellison will run the company. Just said it, I'll say it again. We're in for a protracted period of large dollar figures 
and strange machinations of businesses as the concept of money gets integrated into an age of machines. There's a lot going on here. Alameda Research, FTX Ventures, FTX. I don't know much about FTX, so it's probably not worth commenting at all. I just have always felt that it's suspicious, suspect, when a business that ostensibly is there to go and create value in the marketplace of its own also has an investment arm. It just seems like a like strange bedfellows, use a probably outdated phrase. I don't know. Turner Wright Coin Telegraph. Coinbase launches a voter registration tool. Chief Policy Officer for Yar Shurzad says lawmakers elected in the U.S. midterms will make, quote unquote, key decisions on crypto. Probably an incredibly affordable decision on Coinbase's part to build some tool for voter registration because there aren't already enough easily accessed tools for voter registration. I understand that registering and maintaining valid registration to vote in US elections is not a solved problem, even though the country is over 200 years old. But something tells me didn't require a tremendous amount of investment in engineering resources on Coinbase's part to do this. And the upside of looking like you as a business are invested in the success of politicians in acquiring and holding office pretty significant. Will those lawmakers elect in the upcoming midterm election? Will the lawmakers elected in this upcoming midterm election in the United States make key decisions on crypto? Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. All right, well, I got two more. Derek DeClo Bloomberg, Open Text plans to buy UK based enterprise software company MicroFocus for around $6 billion, including debt, a 99% premium on Thursday's close. MicroFocus stock jumps 90%. Good luck, friends. Lorenzo Franceschi Bicchieri, Italian's not my language, Vice, the iPhone's lockdown mode disables several features, including loading custom fonts, making it easy for websites to identify that a visitor is using the mode. I suppose that's a bit of a vulnerability, right? If you put your put your uh, DEF CON hat on, concealing the fact that your device is operating in a more secured mode, probably in the best interest of maintaining sort of maximum operational security. So that's not good. I don't know how you solve that. You either 
you either stop reporting the font information that's loaded, or probably the easier solution if you're Apple is when you enter your device into lockdown mode, it picks the most generic system default font and falsely reports that you're using that font. Um, but I don't know, maybe, maybe my engineering brain isn't working properly, but that seems like a fairly straightforward thing to do. So hopefully they can fix that because this is something that probably won't get a lot of attention, but the fact that Apple is engineering a higher security mode where their devices can be operated is a good thing because there are people all over the world who rely on what Apple builds to do mission critical shit, life and death shit in some circumstances would not surprise me. So good for them. That's all I have to say.